Uh, my name is Reverend Daryl Harris, um, student at Johns Hopkins, and also a founding member of the Black Church Food Security Network, and I pastor a church in Baltimore called the Newborn Community of Faith Church. Um, love of neighbor. So I, I love Baltimore. I was born there. Um, my love for Baltimore is kind of forged, not of the soil, but out of joyous memories. Uh, and so it's such that I, I can't escape it. And so I spent some time away from Baltimore. I was, I was here in Durham for Divinity School, then I was in Africa, um, living there and meeting my wife. And then I came back to Baltimore and I just wanted to love the city. And really I wanted the city to love me. And so I took a job at uh, Johns Hopkins Center for Livable Future. I was managing a project called the Baltimore Food and Faith Project. And one of the things that the Center for Livable Future does is they, they map um, food environments. And so here you see three maps. Uh, on, the f on your left, on my left, excuse me, my left, your right, you see the food environment map. That map has the deep red speckles on the kind of like the elbows of the city. Uh, that's, we call these areas, just at the time it was termed food deserts. So CLF made this map, and that map was, it told us all the areas in the city that, um, where healthy food was not available. And these, when we say healthy food not available, we mean blatantly unavailable, right? There's other places in the city where healthy food is a challenge, but in these areas, it was beyond the challenge. It was, it's unreasonable to expect that anyone who lives in these areas were to, were to ever eat healthy food regularly at least. And so I found this map, and then I found another map, the one you see in the middle, which is a race map. And so the dark spaces are the spaces that, um, where black people have the highest concentration. So in the darkest of the spaces, black people make up 95% or more of the residents, and then in the lighter spaces, it's, it's close to zero, right? And so when I look at the food environment map and then I look at the race map, then I see the overlay where um, the places that are the blackest are also the places where there's um, inadequate healthy food supply. And then I'm going to overlay that on top of the life expectancy map. And then I see the places that have the, the least availability of healthy food, which are also the black places, are also the places where people are dying the youngest. And so in the race map, the places that are the deepest red, you're dying the youngest, and if it's the uh, places that are the brightest green, you're living the longest. And so I pastor a church that's in one of those deep red spaces, and in that space, the, average, the, the life expectancy at birth is 20 years younger than the places that are in deep green. This is in the same city, we're drinking the same water, we have the same mayor, same city council, but very different results, very different experiences um, in terms of, uh, of the life course. And so uh, my dear friend, uh, Reverend Dr. Heber Brown, he liked to say, uh, we, we were talking about food deserts, and he said, that's not just, it's not just a food desert over there, man. It's also, it's an employment desert, it's a, it's a power desert, it's, uh, it's a life desert. And we said, okay, you know what, that's, that's, that's probably most right. And so now the term food desert is kind of like an antiquated term. No one uses that term anymore, especially not in Baltimore. Anybody's working on this food system. Now we use a term called food apartheid because it most, it most aptly uh, demonstrates the political nature of what is happening and that it falls upon along racial lines and the fact that it is, in fact, a created environment. It's not, it didn't happen organically. Right? These are things that people, people have thought, thought these things through. So if you live in a dark red area, in Baltimore, like the area where my church is, um, the liquor store density is twice the city average. It's almost twice the average of the bar district within the city. The uh, tobacco outlet density is well above the city average. The, um, the rat infestation, the calls the people are, are calling to 311 to the city council asking them to come help with rat problems almost five times the city average. All right. um, the list goes on and on and on. You're, you're, you're more than twice as more likely to be a victim of a crime if you live in that neighborhood. Um, 
There's so many statistics, but the general point is that you have a, you're, you're having a hard life if you live in one of these deep red neighborhoods. And if you live in one of these bright green neighborhoods, life can be dandy. Um, so what do we do about it? And so my church, the Newborn Community of Faith Church, um, under the direction of the previous pastor, uh, Elder C.W. Harris, created a farm. And it's called the Strength to Love Two Farm, right? And as our problems in our neighborhoods and our city are manifold, it's impossible to just focus on one thing, right? So whenever we tackle an issue, it's always trying to tackle multiple layers. And so we have Strength to Love Two Farm, and that farm is, of course, growing food. It's right in the middle of um, a very blighted area of Baltimore. It's not a, it's, you know, the area is not all bad. There's some great things happening in the area. But this area is, has been made famous by the, uh, the death of Freddie Gray in police custody. So this is the neighborhood that Freddie Gray is from, right? So 1.5 acre farm. It hires intentionally um, citizens returning from incarceration or other people would have a hard time finding employment. We do job training. We do, um, really we just give people, we just, we just allow people to have a job that is dignifying, that pays them and where they are respected and they can contribute back to their neighborhood. And so we grow this food, we sell it to high-end retailers, and then we also make um, a portion of the food available to people in the neighborhood. And people in the neighborhood can eat it and enjoy it and benefit from, from that. And then next we have the Black Church Food Security Network. So the Black Church Food Security Network is a project that was um, really uh, a brainchild of a Reverend Dr. Heber Brown he came to myself and a lady named, a lady farmer named Aaliyah Fraser, and we sat down and we talked it over and we said, okay, let's create this network where we're gonna um, bring produce grown um, primarily from African American farmers and sell them within African American churches. And so this was our first church soil to sanctuary farm stand. It's happening with inside, inside a church. It's on North Avenue, which is one of the infamous streets in Baltimore City. And this is during their, one of their regular gathering times. And the Leah Fraser is the one that's pictured there. She's selling um, the produce that she grew on her farm that is, at the time it was, um, she was growing this food on Harriet Tubman's ancestral land um, on the eastern, eastern shore of Maryland. So this was, this was highly significant, significant for us. And for us, we named, this, we named this network the Black Church Food Security Network. And it had to be the Black Church Food Security Network because um, the people who are most affected by the problem are black people, frankly, and there's a lot of black churches in that space. And one, one of the things that we wanted to see, we wanted the imagination of people who are living in depressed areas to see that they can solve their, some of their own issues. It doesn't take an outsider to come in and rescue them. Um, so we wanted to broaden that imagination. And so we named it the Black Church Food Security Network. We worked intentionally with black farmers, and it was, read, it was, it was led by by black pastors. Um, and then we have um, non-black non allies who partner with us, who are willing to get behind the vision and to support the work, and we welcome and are grateful for that. All right, so <clears throat> the solutions. Now, love of neighbor. Of course, within Christianity, love of neighbor is the central tenet. And so I'm naming the solution love of neighbor because the two, are, the two should be hand in hand, right? I'm not, I'm, I, we have to stop imagining solutions that are not loving. The solutions have to be, have to be loving. So the first, the first solution I like to say is the declustering of poverty. Um, most of the people who live in high, in, ha, in high density poverty areas did not choose to live there. They were kind of assigned there. And so that assignment, we're, we're assigning people housing. The housing doesn't have to be in places where there's already large amounts of stress. And so if someone wants to build a low income housing in your neighborhood or adjacent to your neighborhood, don't fight them. Let, 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 let them build that, that, that a complex so that, um, so that all the problems of the city are not clustered in these areas that are pretty much primarily for black people. All right, we should, we should spread it around. Okay, and then the, the second thing you wanna do is support local black farmers and food efforts. All right, there's a lot of, people in the city that are working on this in cities all across America, Chicago, Baltimore, Philadelphia, DC, 
uh, Milwaukee, all over the place, there are people who are doing these efforts and we really need to support them, give them the funding, give them the moral support that they need so that they can be um, successful. And then the last thing that I like to raise up is that we have to address food affordability. And so right now, it, to buy, you can buy 10 chicken nuggets from Burger King for $1, or I can buy a pound of lettuce for five, six dollars. Um, the chicken nuggets seem a lot more attractive, right? And so, but the reason why that's cheap is because of subsidies. And so either we need to tamp down some of the subsidies for, for meat suppliers, or we need to ramp up the sub subsidies for vegetable growers so that there can be uh, some type of price equity and people can kind of lean towards the thing that is actually beneficial towards them and not lean towards the thing that is destructive. All right, thank you.